The ABC of the Universe. Today's talk in this BBC series is called The Radio Galaxy and is concerned with how the radio astronomer sees the Milky Way. It is given by Professor R. Hanbury Brown of Jodrell Bank. Almost all our knowledge of things beyond our own Earth has come to us by radiation which can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. It is true we have learnt something from satellites and probes which travel outside the atmosphere. But nearly all the experiments carried out so far with these have been concerned with local things within our own solar system. In due course, we can look forward to learning a lot more in this way because satellites can receive radiation from a much wider range than we can on Earth. This, of course, is because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs so much useful radiation. The most obvious sorts of radiation which penetrate the Earth's atmosphere are, of course, light and heat. But there are others less obvious. For example, the fast particles called cosmic rays, which are studied by physicists. And then there are the radio waves used by radio astronomers with which I am concerned today. These are exactly the same sort of waves as light and heat, but they have a much longer wavelength. Typically, radio astronomers study waves of a length of about one foot as opposed to the infinitesimal fraction of an inch that is the wavelength of light. This long wavelength has both advantages and disadvantages for the astronomer. One useful thing about the radio waves that pierce the atmosphere is that they will travel through clouds without being scattered in the way that light is. Not only through the sorts of clouds we have in the atmosphere, but also through the great clouds of dust that lie out in space, cutting off the light from distant stars and preventing us from actually seeing most of our galaxy. On the other hand, a serious disadvantage of long waves is that they need correspondingly large instruments to focus them. Radio telescopes are large and expensive, and when all is said and done, they give us only a very blurred picture of the sky. Nevertheless, we accept our limitations. We scan the sky with our radio telescope, and we compare our picture of it with the picture seen by our colleagues, the optical astronomers. First, let us make this comparison in daylight. In the daytime, we take it for granted that we can't see the stars. In fact, this is because the light from the sun is scattered by the Earth's atmosphere to such an extent that the whole sky is bright. And against this bright background, we can pick out only the sun and perhaps the moon. The radio astronomer's view is different. The sun is still bright to him, but it no longer dominates the sky. The Earth's atmosphere does not scatter the longer radio waves in which he is interested, and he can study objects well beyond the solar system by day as well as by night. If we wait till the night, then of course the optical astronomers come into their own. They see a host of stars, the brightest appearing in all directions because they're close but the fainter ones concentrated into a band which we call the Milky Way. This band is a view of our galaxy seen from within. It's a side-on view of the flattened disk of stars that makes up the galaxy as seen from our own position about two-thirds of the way out from the centre. The radio astronomer sees something quite different and rather surprising. He doesn't see the stars except for the Sun and he only sees that because it's so close. The familiar constellations like the Plough and the Southern Cross have all gone. But their place is taken not by obscurity, but by a wholly new picture. Now, the radio telescopes reach through the dark clouds of dust and show us another aspect of our galaxy. There is a bright band of radio emission which follows the Milky Way across the sky. It's brightest when we are looking towards the centre of our galaxy. It is clear beyond any doubt that this bright band comes from the galaxy, but there is still a lot about it which we don't understand. First of all, the radio waves which make up the bright band are not coming from the stars. Their origin is still partly mysterious, but in the last few years we've begun to understand it. There seem to be at least three ways in which these waves are generated. The first way, and incidentally the only one which is reasonably well understood, is by hot hydrogen gas in the space between the stars. This space is not, as one might imagine, a vacuum, but instead 
is filled with a very, very thin gas, mostly hydrogen. Near a hot star, the hydrogen atoms get broken up into oppositely charged parts, protons and electrons. And it is the rapid motion of the electrons which generates some of the radio waves which we see coming from the Milky Way. But this hot hydrogen cannot explain the whole of the bright band of radio emission. There is some more powerful and unusual process also at work between the stars. And it is one of the main tasks of radio astronomy today to track down and explain just what this process is. I can give you a stop press report of our present ideas about this, but I can't guarantee that they won't have changed by tomorrow. At present, we believe that the process we are trying to explain is caused by very high-speed particles travelling through the space between the stars. We think that these particles are made to give off the radiation which we pick up on Earth when they pass through the weak magnetic fields that must exist in the interstellar gas. But, as I said, that idea may have changed by tomorrow. Finally, we come to the third source of radio waves from our galaxy. This third source is exploded stars, or as astronomers call them, supernovae. A supernova is a massive star, which, reaching a critical condition in its interior, explodes and blows off its mass in an expanding cloud. The best known supernova is the Crab Nebula, which is the remains of a star which actually exploded in AD 1054. We find that these expanding clouds are powerful radio sources, and we see them by our radio telescope as bright patches against the continuous, fainter background of the band that follows the Milky Way. Incidentally, it seems possible that these remnants of supernovae may be the original sources of the fast particles which I mentioned earlier on. I dealt at some length with the origin of the radio waves from our galaxy because their origin is vital to our interpretation of what we see with our radio telescopes. We can make, and we have made, detailed radio maps of the sky. And, as I said, these maps show us the Milky Way very clearly indeed. So we do know we are looking at our own galaxy. But until we know more about the origin of our waves, we have no proper key to our maps. Let me give you just one clear example. Our radio maps show, much to our surprise, that the galaxy, which as you will remember is a large flat disk of stars, is completely surrounded by an immense sphere of radio emission. We call this sphere the galactic halo or corona. Now this corona cannot be seen optically. There are no stars or anything obvious like that in it. We suspect that the corona is a vast ball of very thin gas, but we don't yet know how it was formed, how it is supported, or where it gets its energy from in order to give off radio waves. So far, I am afraid I've presented a rather nebulous picture of the radio galaxy, but it is at least a picture which will tell us a lot when we understand it. Now let's look at a different and clearer picture which radio astronomers have put together. You may remember that optical astronomers find that many galaxies show a pattern of spiral arms which stick out from a central nucleus. But they are not sure if this is true of our own galaxies. Radio astronomers have been able to confirm that these arms do exist in our own galaxy and have been able to give us a clear picture of them. They have done this by studying the cold hydrogen gas which collects between the stars of the spiral arms. This cold hydrogen cannot be observed optically because it doesn't radiate light. But it does radiate on one particular radio wavelength, 21 centimetres. So if we, so to speak, tune our radio telescope to pick up 21 centimetre waves, we can detect clouds of this otherwise invisible hydrogen in the Milky Way. Next, we want to find out where the hydrogen is and how much there is of it. We can get the direction of a particular cloud of hydrogen from the direction our radio telescope is pointing. And we can find out how much hydrogen is in the cloud from the strength of the radiation. We can also, and this is less obvious, get the distance of the cloud by measuring its speed. 
I think I can best explain how we work out the distance of the clouds like this. Our galaxy, which is rather like a huge cartwheel, turns slowly all the time about its centre. But unlike a solid wheel, the time for one complete rotation around the centre is not the same for all parts of the wheel. The time depends on the distance from the centre. If you work this out in detail, you'll find that because of this varying speed, some parts of the galaxy seem to be approaching the Earth and some to be receding. Their speed relative to us depends on their distance. So by measuring the speed with which a particular cloud is approaching or receding, we can work out how far away from us it is. Knowing the direction and distance of gas clouds, we can now go on to plot a map of cold hydrogen gas in the galaxy. In fact, this has been done, and it is, in my view, the most important contribution which radio astronomers have made to knowledge so far, for it gives the first reasonably complete picture of our own galaxy. We already knew from optical work that the galaxy is a thin disk of stars with a diameter of about 70,000 light years, and that the sun lies in this disk at about 25,000 light years out from the centre. We also suspected that this disk had a pattern of spiral arms. But now, since cold hydrogen gas happens to be concentrated into these spiral arms, when we look at the radio astronomer's map of this gas, we can really see for the first time, and it is a spectacular sight, the spiral structure of our galaxy. We can now see that the disk of the galaxy is not smooth and featureless, but is made up of spiral arms. We can count these arms, and we can see how thick they are. We can also follow them out from near the sun into regions well beyond the galactic centre, from which light could never reach us because of the clouds of interstellar dust. In conclusion, we've seen that the radio astronomer sees a different view of the galaxy to the optical astronomer. The optical astronomer is mainly concerned with the stars. The radio astronomer is more concerned with what goes on in the space between the stars than he is with the stars themselves. It is in this space that we find the gas from which the stars are born. And so the investigation of this gas, made possible by radio astronomy, helps us to understand how the stars seen by the optical astronomer came into being. In fact, at the moment, the task of research, and a very inviting task, is to try to make one picture of the galaxy out of these two different views. That was The Radio Galaxy, the fourth talk in the BBC series The ABC of the Universe. It was given by Professor R. Hanbury-Brown of Jodrell Bank.